Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Saturday. We have a special guest, as always. I try to bring someone each and every week to hope that you guys can gain an inside perspective or get get some sort of motivation or something from the show and grab a hold of it and piece it together. And today I brought a very special guest today. This is the speech pathologist, Lindsay Unger. And she's going to share with you what a speech pathologist is and give you some insight on how you could practice speech therapy at home. So she's already on the screen. There is Hi. Lindsay. Hey, Thanks Lindsay. For me. Yeah. So, um, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be on and to be able to provide this information. Um, this is new for me doing a live show like this. So I really appreciate you involving me and I love the work that you're doing. I had a chance to watch a few of the shows that you've done in the past and I think your mission is really inspiring. Um, wow. And what a Thank cool you. avenue for me to kind of spread the message of how important a speech pathologist can be in your life. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Now, um, if you could, could go a little bit in detail, you know, obviously as much as you want of who uh, Lindsay Unger is. Sure, uh, I'll tell you a little about my story. So I wasn't initially thinking speech pathology for my life. I started off wanting to go into the teaching world so I got my bachelor's in liberal studies and um, was in the teaching credentialing program, initially geared towards elementary school. And then I, I found speech pathology just through various avenues um, on my journey there. And I fell in love. It was like one of those love at first sight type of moments where it was like, bam, something hit me. This is what I meant to do. And it was weird. Yeah. I hadn't felt that kind of passion uh, ever. And so I tried to see, okay, what is, you know, I have this teaching degree, what am I gonna do with this? There really nothing matches up with communication disorders and sciences and a master's is necessary for the degree. So I literally switched routes, went back to school, got another bachelor's degree <laughs> and then entered the master's program. So what, four years later, a uh, lots of education and and student loans later yeah yeah got my degree um i was so lucky that i kind of there's different routes you can take with speech pathology and sometimes you just don't know which route you want to take um, when you're first starting off in school because you're being bombarded with all of this generalized information but i again had one of those like moments where I was in my anatomy class and I was like, ooh, that's really cool. This is this is for me. And mm -hmm. and then I started to really um, delve into more of the medical side. And my internship landed me at the VA hospital. And what a amazing experience that was to start off because the VA allows you not only the amazing um, job of working with veterans, but the types of disorders that you see, it's um, such a wide range. So cool, teaching hospital where you get to see everything. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to be hired on as full time after that and worked there for uh, a really long time until uh, we moved out here to San Diego. And now I'm working at UC San Diego Health in the rehab services department. And I'm the senior speech pathologist in the Neuro Rehab Center over there. Um, it's, uh, again, a really wonderful position. I still have so much passion for what I do. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. I have a, a family of my own now. And uh, we have a, a two-year-old and a three-year-old boys. Um, boys are awesome. Boys are interesting. <laughs> People ask me all the time, having kids of your own, do you have any interest in working with children? And I said, after doing what I do at work, no, absolutely <laughs> not. I give so much praise for people who can work with children, but there's something about working with adults 
um, who have gone through life, they have so much experience under their belt, and then bam, something hits them that completely changes their life, knocks them upside down, and puts them in a position they've never had to deal with before. And then I get to be a part of that journey to yes. help find their way back to themselves is such a cool thing. Exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah. There you go. And and what what uh the last portion that you said there, you know, you know, you these these things that happen to us, you know, the especially when you're older in life, you know, you have you have a stroke and boom, you get hit with it, completely alters your life forever. You know, you 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 think your life's going one way and then all of a sudden you have a stroke and you know, obviously completely change direction. And now you're stuck wondering, you know, most people are stuck wondering, you know, why me, why did this happen to me? You know, and especially the guy that I ha had on uh, last Thursday, you know, his, his, uh, his grandmother told him, you know, why not you baby? Why not you? You know, so that's like one of the things, you know, that I tried to not necessarily preach, but I try to help people see, you know, I try to pave a path for others to follow. You know, that's why I bring on these guests to, you know, hope that they can grab just a little tidbit from them, you know, and along their journey and realize, you know, if Caleb, if um, Mark, if Peter, if John, can get through it and I can relate to that story just a little bit, then it pay, then, you know, it becomes a beautiful picture. So that's exactly why. And it's the, the same thing that you just said, you know, you get to watch that journey unfold because you're with that person, you know, every step of the way. Exactly. I love getting to know a person and, you know, it's still the same person. You're still the same person, but things have changed and you have to find this new normal. And will things ever go back to the way they were before, pre-stroke or pre-whatever happened? Uh, probably not. It's a new normal that you have to figure out and um, things will get better. Uh, it's, it's a journey, like you said. And yep. I love being a part of that journey and, and watching them kind of find this new normal. Mm -hmm be successful and improve their quality of life and regain relationships and uh it's wonderful awesome yeah now uh let's go ahead and dive into it shall we sure that's great all right so uh why don't you go ahead and explain to the community what a speech language pathologist is sure so like I said, uh, with myself, it's a master's level degree for speech pathology and communication disorders and sciences. And uh, the training we get, a lot of background in anatomy and physiology, um, and we're trained in many different ways in various different, uh, universities. But the, the skills that we gain would allow us to work in so many different settings, which is such a draw for the job itself. Um, any kind of area of interest. Uh, so we can work in the schools. So we can work with young babies who are uh, in the hospital in the NICU learning to feed, uh, learning to breastfeed and are having a difficult time, cleft palate, things like that. We can work with early intervention, young children who are just learning language and having a hard time grasping on to, to language. We can work in uh, nursing homes. We can work in hospice units. So we can work in an acute care facility, rehab units, outpatient. Um, there's so many various avenues which you can grow in our field that it makes it really great. Um, yeah, that is, that is a pretty broad range there, yeah. yeah. I didn't realize that it was actually, you know, something that you can go in, like, as you said, the, uh, the nursing aspect, I didn't realize that was your area of expertise there. You know, be, being that I've had four kids, you know, the, the nursing that comes in there with the latching, I didn't realize that was that was your area there. Yeah, there's a lot of pathologists that specialize in who are actually lactation consultants as well. 
Um, again, occupational therapy and these other services are really involved with that as well. Um, but speech pathologists are typically a part of that picture. And um, home health, and you'll find speech pathologists everywhere. So that's one of the reasons I loved it is because you have so much flexibility and, um, and we treat all sorts of disorders under the sun, which is part of that broad education that we receive. So mm -hmm. uh, in my area, the medical side, voice, swallowing, language, naming and reading and writing uh, will treat uh, if I already mentioned swallowing, uh, cognitive linguistic disorders such as memory and attention and planning and organization, all the things that you need to be a successful person. And, um, you know, communication is just, it should be a God given right. You know? And when that's taken away from you or when it's just not the same anymore, that's where we are to step in and help you. And um, so anything under the sun, essentially, that is involved with communication, I mentioned voice, and that's also tied to the respiratory system. When someone has a stroke, sometimes they'll, I think in your situation, you mentioned a, a, yeah, stroke. I had a, I had a stroke. Yeah. And so speech pathologists are involved in restoring the upper airway function when someone has a trach or if they're connected to a ventilator. We'll sometimes work with people who are still on the ventilator, be able to uh, be able to communicate and um, so and then head and neck cancers we work a lot in in that area uh, people who have had laryngectomies being able to communicate despite their entire voice box being gone um so yeah we're we're everywhere so you know sign language i do know sign language myself um not yeah. every speech pathologist is gonna know sign language but um you bring up a really good point of kind of like we use this whole body approach to communicating and gesture, yes, is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, I mean, we kind of we kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, what is the role of a speech language pathologist with regard to uh, stroke rehabilitation? Well, that was kind of a tongue twister there. Like rehabilitation. Nice. Wow. You got there that work. Right. <laughs> you're already you're already helping me with my with my speech therapy here. There you go. Over articulation. That was <laughs> um, so I think you know the obvious ones are you go in to see a speech pathologist and we do the assessment and we'll assess several different areas and then we do treatment based on what our findings are and what the goals are. But we do <laughs> more than just so that. So how does the how does the assessment work like? You know, do you do it like a quiz? Like you go in, you talk to them. Like how does how exactly does the assessment work? Sure, and it, it it will change based on your setting. So like an inpatient assessment versus where I am in an outpatient world, where you can take a little bit more time, really delve into different areas and. Um, really get to know a person versus like the acute side where you're seeing somebody only for a short amount of time. So you have to deal with what are the issues right here and now that we can deal with and help you be successful and safe in the hospital. So in, in the hospital, what we typically do for assessment, um, if we're getting a new stroke person, typically a swallow assessment is going to be part of that. So we'll go in and do a bedside screening check to make sure that you're not coughing and choking, that things aren't getting stuck in your throat, that you're able to tolerate certain food textures or even liquid textures and not choke or aspirate while you're in the hospital. And then when you get discharged, uh, lots of caregiver training. And actually we do a lot of nursing and physician training too, making sure that the nursing orders are in there to make sure you're swallowing properly. Um, and we do the modified barium swallow studies as well. You probably had gone through one of those um, if you had a trach uh, or if you were on a ventilator or mm -hmm. if you had a stroke, um, you may have gone through one of those. And so that's something a speech pathologist is, is doing. Um, another uh, type of assessment we would do are screeners for language, uh, looking at writing and reading and repetition, looking at how clear is your speech. How is your face looking? We would do kind of a modified neuro exam, checking out all the cranial nerves. 
Um, and then based on the findings of those assessments, um, we do standardized assessments. Um, in the hospital, they're typically a little bit quicker type of assessments that can be done um, and you can get goals going right away. Uh, outpatient, we do more in-depth standardized assessments typically that take a lot longer to do. Um, it really, really delves into the detailed areas of communication and, and swallow and voice. But let's say you're in the hospital, you get that screener done, and then the speech pathologist will come up with goals, the swallow goals, the voice goals, the language goals, ways to make you the most functional person possible um, during that hospital stay. So, um, and it's usually based on your personal goals and like kind of the issues at hand going on. Um, maybe you're having trouble communicating with the physician, your pain level, or maybe the nurse just is having a difficult time understanding that your stomach is hurting or that you need something or that um, you need to be turned in bed or that you're getting a bed sore or, you know, kind of the, the issues at hand at the time. Mm -hmm. So the speech pathologist will take, you know, those functional goals and work on them um, in various different ways. In the outpatient world, the assessment is going to be more, we're going to, um, I mean, there's so many different types of speech assessments out there, and um, it's hard to kind of touch on any one in particular, but we're, again, it's like this whole body approach in our assessment method. And then we always look at your personal goals. It's this really in-depth interview. What are the problems you're having at work? What are the problems you're having at home? What are the issues you're having with communicating with your kids or grandchildren? And, and that's how we kind of formulate our goals. Yes, the, the test says you have trouble with comprehension. Okay, how do we make that a functional goal? Do we work on, okay, can you understand these questions from a book? Maybe not, but can you, let's compile a list of possible questions you would get asked in the household. Right. And let's on those types of goals. Right, right. Always focus on function. I think that's really important. Um, so that's the assessment component. And then, of course, treatment is, um, you know, based on whatever we find in the test. Um, and so, then, mm -hmm. so, like, the most, now you're saying, like, the, you know, communicating with the nurse for, uh, you know, simple tasks and whatnot. Stop shaking. <laughs> so, you know, communicating uh, with the nurse for simple tasks and whatnot. Now, I remember when when I was in the hospital, they had like a little board, you know, with words on it and whatnot. And I was asked, to, you know, I'd point to the word. And that's how essentially, you know, because I had the trach in and whatnot. And that's how I would communicate. Yeah. And then if I didn't have the board, you know, I would mouth and just like hope that they wouldn't get it or that they would get it. And then when they wouldn't get it, I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, trying to say this, but they couldn't, you know, read my lips, you know. And uh, so that's one of the things, you know, is like how important or how useful is, you know, like one of those little boards that you have that has like, yes, no, bathroom, you know, just like certain and, you know, standard responses or, you know, something like that. Sure, good question. Those are handed out now. I think nursing is handing those out too um, with their stroke patients because of, if they just can't get the message across so they can't figure out what the person needs based on language, they'll have someone point. But then what happens if the picture uh, aren't kind of registering with the person? What if they're too abstract? What if they're, um, the person does better with actual photos versus the little line drawings that are there that can be abstract? What happens if the person uh, doesn't recognize the words written on that page? What if they can't see that that clearly says yes or no? So a speech pathologist would then customize the communication board or kind of guide a family to using some uh, like higher tech communication. So I'm gonna pull out like a little app right now that you can see one particular way of getting some messages across. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, 
Maybe. Okay. So this is just a really simple free app that a lot of speech pathologists would have on their iPad. Um, and then anyone can download it on their phone. Moderate pain. And so not only does it have just moderate, moderate pain, pain, but it has a photo of how someone is feeling. And then it's color coded because red, you know, means like, no, don't go. Worst pain possible. And so the pictures are a little bit more clear. And these are free little things that anyone can access. Just yeah, to kind of base what the person yeah. can do. Yeah, well, I'll go ahead and make sure to, uh, you know, put the link to that app in the uh, the description of this YouTube video. For sure. There's so many free apps just like that where you can even have a customized communication board put on there. And it's really nice because you can have it say something and then you can try to work on repeating it out loud. I love that it combines that audio component to it. Um, great. Uh, if someone doesn't have use of their arms or hands, because that's also a, sometimes a component of stroke. Right. Uh, there are other ways of communicating other than like actual touch and pointing. And that's another thing that speech pathologists can be in charge of is figuring out how can we get this person to communicate. Technology has grown so much. It's so cool what's coming out now for communication. There are, let's say someone isn't able to move their arms, they aren't able to move their legs, they aren't able to speak. We can still potentially get someone to communicate using devices that are eye based. So a computer would have an infrared reader that would kind of read where your eyes are moving on a screen. Really? And then it it can kind of respond based on what your eyes are doing, either wow. a stare response or a blink response, or you can even use like a little a mouse to respond. So your eyes are the mouse, essentially. Wow. Pretty cool. They have yeah. head if you have range of motion of your head, a little mouse, kind of a little dot on your head, you can look around a screen. Right. So Same. really you can compensate for pretty much any impairment. I've seen yeah. these devices where they have EMG responses, where you can hook up a sensor electrode to someone's face, and if they can twitch their muscle, you can use that as an activation for the computer too. That's so insane. Pretty cool stuff, yeah. Yeah, that is talk about high tech. Holy moly! Oh yeah, so that's that's a speech pathologist who you'd want to see if it, um, if that type of thing was needed. But that's you know part of the assessment. We try to see again this whole body approach. Can the person access a device like a phone or an iPad? And if not, how can we make them utilize technology or something else? So, right, just yeah. adapt. That I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, what are the typical stroke-related disorders a speech pathologist sees? So. Um, there's so many different things, and um, I would say the most typical thing that in the inpatient world we see is probably dysphagia or a swallow impairment. And um, a lot of you who have had strokes may have had experience with having a swallow disorder. Uh, the swallow disorders that speech pathologists are in charge of is the oral stage and the pharyngeal stage of swallowing. We also do little screening of the lower part of how food passes through the esophagus. We're more focused on what's happening here after a stroke or a brain injury or uh, some other neurological disease or whatever else might be going on that's affecting your swallow. So that's really a prevalent thing we're going to see. Um, we also work with aphasia. I think we know a lot about uh, aphasia and that's been spoken about on your show before. Aphasia. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a fancy word for a problem with communicating. Right. A problem with repeating, a problem with comprehension, a problem with expressing yourself, reading, writing, and um, we'll see apraxia as a, a huge one, especially if you've had a stroke. Apraxia is a little different than other speech disorders, a little harder to diagnose for us, but what it is is a disconnect between your brain kind of knows what it wants to say 
and you'll go ahead and send the signals to your mouth and the movements that you need to make to say it, such as responsible. But what will come out is not responsible. It might be completely jumbled, or it might sound stuttered, or you might be like groping to find the sound that you're trying to come up with. And it's um, like this disconnect in the programming for the speech muscles. And we work a lot with that if you've had a stroke. Um, dysarthria is another one that um, it's kind of like, you know you, you're having a stroke if all of a sudden your speech becomes slurred, right? right and it right. sounds kind of like you're intoxicated, but you've mm -hmm. had nothing to drink and it doesn't make sense. And dysarthria can last with you long after you have the initial uh, stroke symptoms. And um, it's, it's one of those really prevalent disorders that we see. Um, trach and bend, of course, we mentioned voice disorders. We work a lot with voice, voice for speaking. There's speech pathologists who do voice for singing. Um, yeah, those are the, the big ones. So the, the gentleman that I had on last, or on Thursday, uh, Sergeant Johnson, he, he was saying how um, he was able to sing before he could talk. Yeah. Which is which uh, he said that his uh, speech therapist thought, you know, she's she said that she's never seen that before. Mm. You know, so he could sing what he wanted, but he couldn't speak it. Yeah. So you're kind of accessing a different part of the brain. Let's say like, you know, if, if language is affected, if your speech is slurred and if you have a praxia or you have a swallow impairment, Sometimes that's the left side of the brain that's impacted and um, singing is kind of a different area and it might be an unaffected part of the brain. It's also like long-term storage. So even if you can't speak at all and even if I show you this and you don't know what it is, I'll start to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday and something will register in your head like the intonation patterns that I'm using. The words are so ingrained in long-term memory storage that you'll start to be able to sing it. And it's like, whoa, where did that come from? That's so that's why we can remember songs that we haven't heard in like 20 <laughs> years out of nowhere. Yeah. And then, you know, speech pathologists can kind of try to mold that into language. So like, happy birthday to, and then you start to work on someone's name. So it's... um. It's a really great tool you can use. Time, it's time for you to go on American Idol. That's right. There you go. I do <laughs> voice therapy all day long. <laughs> I'm used to making a fool of myself and <laughs> still out. So there you go. <laughs> so when uh, when I've had Doctor Levo on here a few times, and we've talked about uh, how the brain is an amazing, you know, an amazing thing, the amazing tool that we have. And it can create new neurological pathways in your brain. So say one part of your brain is damaged from your stroke. Uh, your brain can create a new neurological pathway to reconnect or to uh, uh, reconnect, you know. So are you finding that, you know, the same thing can happen with speech? A hundred percent. And I have come to me all the time and they say, well, I'm outside of the time frame that I was given. So the, the six month time frame that you're often told about is that area of the fastest spontaneous recovery that your brain does. And we try to catch people during that spontaneous recovery while your brain and the edema, the swelling and, and all of that is starting to go down because we can make really good gains during that time. And, and pathologists and physical therapists, occupational therapists, we try to take advantage of that and try to speed recovery. But then, you know, after six months, what happens? So that doesn't mean that it's like a like an expiration date, like no changes can be made. So then you'll hear, okay, then the next six months, you'll still get a little spontaneous recovery of the brain, but it'll be slower. And, and that's true. And then what happens after that year? It's like, oh, well, to heck with it, I'm just gonna kind of give up, this is the way it is. But it's not true by any means. And um, explaining that to people hopefully can give a lot of hope that 
changes can be made. We're lifelong learners, no matter what the situation. And the reason for that is our brains are like so amazing. We can kind of the areas that have been broken down by a stroke, there's been this loss of, of cells that are um, functioning cells can create new connections all the time. So mm -hmm. we can start to work on new activities in new, in new and different ways and the new connections start to be built. So other areas of the brain are then like taking over for the area that's impaired. And this neuroplasticity type of deal that you, I think you've talked about, and Dr. Alibo yeah. touched on, yeah. it's so amazing to see. We can have, we can learn new skills for the lifetime, no matter what's going on, what your situation is, um, what you've been through. If you are motivated and determined, and oh, right there. there you go. Yeah, if you're motivated and determined, you can teach yourself to do new things. And it's consistency, I think, is the key and intensity. So, like, okay, I want to learn how to be able to write again, but I'm past my year recovery. Okay, that means, ah. You know, what can I do? You can do a lot. You can work on tracing letters. You can work on being able to say the letters of the alphabet. Let's see then if you can turn that into tracing your name. And then let's take away your tracing and see if you can write it without that guide. Let's, right. And we can start to add in new words. And let's, um, you know, it's just like taking it a step at a time, but never giving up on it. Yeah, no matter how mundane it seems, you know you're essentially, you know, re reconnecting, relearning how to do things, you know, and, you know, this part of the brain is telling you, this is ridiculous. This is mundane. You know, why am I doing this over and over again? You know, this is stuff I learned when I was in kindergarten, so to speak, you know, why, why am I having to do it now? You know, so it's hard for someone to take in, you know, and, Essentially, you know, as you said, it's something that's repetitive. It's something that you have to keep doing. You have to keep at. And uh, yeah, so exactly what you said. Yeah, and I, I think you brought up a good point. It's like to keep it adult and keep it age appropriate. And if you're going to do worksheets like that, you know, maybe customized worksheets would be better than pulling up like a kindergarten tracing sheet. Um, but no matter how it's worked on, yes, it does feel like you're relearning language because in a sense you are, you're trying to retrain your brain how to do things that maybe have been lost or that are not going as well. So it just feels very repetitive. It's, it's a lot of work, but you can make it fun. You can make it interesting. There's, you know, all sorts of ways to do that. Um, so yeah, um, you know, the, the consistency and the determination that we talk about determined yes i think a, a really important aspect to bring up is a really relevant topic is post-stroke depression and um that's really kind of can become a part of someone's life whereas they've never had to deal with depression before they don't know what it feels like and they don't know why they're having such trouble with motivating themselves mm -hmm. Post-stroke depression is not your fault. It's the, your brain has changed. There's chemical changes and imbalances. And there's parts of your brain that are not working correctly and parts of your brain that are swelled, perhaps, edema. And, and it's not your fault by any means. You're also put in a circumstance you've never been put in before. You were uh, running and going to the gym and you were a highly functional person and then boom, things change, your circumstances change, your quality of life has changed. And so post-stroke depression, I think, needs to be addressed. Um, if we're going to stay determined and stay on a home exercise regimen, I think that, um, again, this whole body approach needs to be looked at. Yeah. Now, um, for someone that, you know, I mean, just exercising in general, for someone that has not had a stroke, you know, it's hard to, uh, you know, stay in that mindset determined and whatnot to, you know, stay on the, the exercise train. So, you know, given that, you know, you one has had a stroke and they're trying to stay on this, 
this uh, therapy, you know, I kind of used in one of the shows, I kind of used it uh, a, a reference analogy as it being the same as a diet. Um, mm -hmm. You go on a diet, you see the most results when you first go on a diet, right? You lose the most weight. Then you start losing, you're losing, you're still losing weight when you're on a diet, but you don't see it because you see yourself every day. The only time you see, the only time you notice that you're lose, losing weight is when you jump on the skill. And, or you go and you see someone a month later and they're like, wow, you look so much skinnier, you know? So the change, that's because the changes are so small, so minute that you don't notice the changes. So what, how, what do you suggest or how do you keep people motivated to continue with their therapy? Mm, that's good. So um, what I'll have people do a lot of the time is when we're starting therapy to take like a baseline video of how you sound. So read out loud for five minutes and video record yourself. And then maybe a month later, do the same thing read from something else for five minutes and then the next month do the same thing and then you're going to look back on these videos six, six months down the road 12 months down the road look back at them so that you can start to really see for yourself from an outsider's perspective these changes that other people are saying wow you sound better and you're feeling like no no i sound the same no you actually don't you've made improvements and here's the evidence um, and helping people get on the exercise train. I mean, you're essentially telling an adult who's out of school, you've got to do homework. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, we'll call it home exercise. We'll call it a task. We'll call it a home challenge, your daily challenge. We'll call it something. If, if the homework doesn't sit well with you and it feels like, ugh, then we'll call it something else. And we'll time it so that uh, we'll put it on a, a daily routine. So just like the gym, you get used to my husband wakes up every morning and he's in the gym by 430 and that's his routine. And while I can't, do that, but that's his routine. And, um, you know, he sticks with his routine. And if he doesn't, it feels really awful. And um, so setting a time of day where you are going to sit down and say before breakfast, I'm going to work on this for 10, 15 minutes is better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm. or say, okay, then before dinner, I'll do another 10, 15 minutes and I'll time it with my meal. And that way it helps me remember, just like you brush your teeth before bed, I remember because it comes before something else. Right. Um, and setting alarms, we have phones now that can you can set alarms to go off every single day at nine o'clock or uh, put it on a calendar or even a big wall calendar and say, yeah, I did my home challenge. I'm going to mark it off that I did it on Monday. And that feels so good. And then you see all these like days marked off. It's like, Whoa, I'm doing awesome. And um, sometimes it's a matter of like, you need actual kind of like extrinsic motivation. So like, okay, I'm going to reward myself at the end of the week. If yeah. I do and stick with it, I get a reward. And that reward is up to you. Or a family member can reward you. There you go. Hey, if I do all my speech therapy this week, Lindsay, you are taking me out to dinner. There you go. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's always up to you, um, of course. But um, you know, you always have to kind of give yourself like a little bit of leeway and say, "Yeah, this is new for me. I haven't done homework in years." Right. So I maybe skip my morning session, but I have a goal in mind. Like, put put that goal on a huge piece of paper on your refrigerator. Put mm. that goal where you spend the most time in huge, large print, because that's the reason. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. That's the reason you're doing it. Sometimes you forget the reasons why life gets in the way, mm. but you have these like little rewards or these visual goal boards, something to keep you motivated, I think that would be yeah. beneficial. Yeah. Homework is such a taboo word for some reason. You know, we, we we went on this virtual uh, 
this virtual schooling thing with uh, the COVID-19 going on. And, uh, you know, I try to tell my son, let's go do homework and he'd freak out. No. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. We're not doing homework. Let's go do schoolwork. And then he was, you know, he was all right with it. It's just, just call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Work. It's your home challenge. Your right? daily challenge. There you go. Like a, like it's a, like it's a, a TV show game, right? There you go. Yeah. So what's uh, now? Let's jump into what everybody is waiting for here. What are uh, some easy therapeutic home activities for patients and caregivers that they can practice at home? That's a good question. Um, so other than seeing a speech therapist, I mean, the, you see a, a therapist only for what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. That's, I mean, there's 23 other hours. So what, what do you do? I mean, do we just wait until we see the speech therapist next or maybe that's not enough, which most likely that's not enough. So we have to challenge your language and do these like language stimulation tasks and, and work at home. There, you don't need to go out and get anything fancy. There's things in your own environment right now. I can see like already 50 different therapeutic opportunities in your background right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just getting a little creative. Um, you know, caregivers, they, they did not have to be a caregiver. It's like their role as a human being changed within a second. And they're, you know, they may not have any resources, they may have little resources. This, they might not have access to black art, fancy things, and they may not have been given education. They may not have a teaching background. So, you know, they're put in this position where they're expected to, and to be the teacher at home. Um, and, and that's a really hard thing to put on someone who doesn't have that kind of background. Yeah. So I think... Um, kind of just like finding things in your environment for language stimulation on a on a regular basis let's say you're you're not the one driving your caregiver is driving and you're driving along and you hit the stoplight so here's your challenge for the day every time you hit the stoplight or a stop sign i want you to name 10 things you see out the window okay i see grass i see, see people walking i saw a dog that's a miniature schnauzer I saw the sunshine, I saw whatever you see, and you're gonna name it as fast as you can. You're, it seems kind of simple, right? So you're targeting, uh, you're targeting a whole lot of things, language processing speed, naming, you're giving yourself a timed challenge and accessing vocabulary. You can work on your speech strategies while you name these things quickly. You can work on your breath support you can work on your intonation pattern while you're saying these things out loud. There's so many different ways and goals that you're targeting just by doing something so simple. Uh, let's say you're in the kitchen, your spouse is making a meal or you're making a meal. I'm gonna name every single ingredient that I'm using while I'm making this meal. Like today I'm making lasagna. And I'm gonna take out the items from the fridge and talk my way through it. I'm gonna feel like I'm on a cooking show. But there you that's go. Okay. That's okay, even if no one's around, then hey, even better, no one cares. Right. So I'm taking out the, the noodles, okay? And then the next thing I'm taking out, so then by the end, you've named like 20 different ingredients. You're working on naming skills, right? But again, you can throw in, oh yeah, I gotta work on my my speech clarity strategies. I'm gonna get loud when I say it, or I'm gonna go really slow when I say these words. I'm gonna use my pausing strategy my speech therapist told me about. I'm going to uh, try not to use uh, the reserve breath, and I'm gonna try to breathe before I say each thing so that I don't run out of breath. Um, and then I can work on sequencing skills at the same time and target executive functioning. Okay, first I have to boil the noodles. What am I gonna do next? Next, I gotta make the sauce and turn on the flame. Next, so that you're working on organiz organizational thinking skills and sequencing and planning. Uh, or you can 
work on writing and come up with the grocery items that you need on a big whiteboard that you need to make that lasagna. So you're thinking about these are everyday tasks that you're going to do anyway. Why not turn it into a therapeutic task? There you go. It could be another one. Really simple. Uh, I have people do this all the time. So let's take, I have a bunch of things here. So <laughs> let's, let's say we're going to do a little therapeutic home exercise. And you can't think of what this darn thing is. It's on the tip of your tongue. You know a lot about it. You like them. But you can't think of that word, and it's so frustrating. So rather than saying, ah, oh, just forget it, I don't want it anyway. No, you do want it. Let's start to rebuild that word. So just because it's missing right now doesn't mean that word needs to always be missing from your vocabulary, right? So I'm going to take the information that I do know. I can see that it's orange, that it's round, that it has a peel that you cut it open and there's stuff inside that's juicy. Look at all this vocabulary and these connections that I'm making with this word. It's like I'm re-remembering everything I know about it. Oh yeah, I really like it and I chop it up and I um, sometimes I put it in a smoothie. And I think that it starts with the letter O and then you start to like write the letter O and it's like, oh, that's an orange. So you didn't skip over the word, you challenged yourself and you're working on rebuilding your connection surrounding this word. So hopefully next time you go and say it, it's like, that's an orange. Um, and while you may not always be able to say it right then and there, you've at least started to make those connections with the word stronger. Then you throw the word into a sentence and say, I'm gonna make an orange for breakfast. I'm gonna top an orange. And then all of a sudden that word becomes more ingrained in your vocabulary. There you go. That makes it's, sense. Just yeah. like just like studying for school or something like that, right? The exactly. More in, the more in depth you go, uh, you know, with your studying, the more, you know, it gets ingrained in your brain. So yes. Yeah. And again, we did the whole body approach. We said, okay, yeah, I'm going to name it. Maybe I can start to spell it. Maybe I can write it down. Maybe I can't do any of that. Maybe I can just draw it or I can show you like the shape of it. So with gesturing, you can write, you can spell, you can start to repeat it or use it in a sentence. And that's something that a caregiver can help kind of cue at home. It's like, I'm gonna pull more and more and more out of you until we feel like we really have a hold on this work. Yeah. Now, uh, what, now let's talk about interdisciplinary care now. So does speech therapy stand alone or do, does it coincide with physical th therapy, occupational therapy? Like how exactly does, does it uh, coincide with everything? Yeah. yeah. So um, speech pathology, our referrals come from multiple different places. Neurology, primary care can come from anywhere. Um, and so that let's say that neurologist puts in a speech pathology consult. Typically speech pathology is in a rehab type of setting or they work with other rehab services. So when you have a stroke, you'll often see like speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, you'll have combined therapies. And that's like um, the typical um, kind of like ideal thing to happen. And um, then the speech pathologist, we communicate with all those other professionals, the neurologist, the primary care, your OT and PT, and then uh, other people start to help you the picture. So depending on what the issue is, we might work with a psychologist if there's post-stroke depression or a psychiatrist even for medication management. We might work with a social worker if there's issues at home with caregivers or uh, whatever the situation might be, uh, resources even. We might work with um, palliative care and goal setting. Or um, palliative care doesn't necessarily mean end of life. It means we need one to help us establish goals. And it's kind of the person that steps in to help like for goal planning and for pain management. And again, it's like thinking about a person as a whole and um, 
kind of working with family members, things like that. Like there's so many different people that we work with. I've worked with dental um, uh, specialists. I've worked with otolaryngologists, ENTs. Um, I've worked with so many other different prosthodontists. So there's so many different professionals we get in touch with regularly. Now, um, so those are all within your network and they all, you guys all speak together and. Um, that would be the ideal. Yeah, ideally, ideally we would all kind of communicate with one another, but sometimes, you know, for whatever reason or whatever facility you're in, that doesn't always happen. So I think the caregiver can kind of be that advocate uh, or the person with aphasia or that has had the stroke can try to be an advocate and make sure you get all your medical records um, or at least like jotting down information during doctor's appointments so that you can bring those notes with you wherever you might end up um, and keep that communication open um, because yeah it doesn't always happen between professionals for whatever reason uh, yeah yeah that's kind of where i was heading with that that was a nice save right there, Lindsay. Good job. I expected that. <laughs> it happens, and you have to be your own advocate no matter what the situation is. Um, so note-taking during appointments, sometimes people will even say to the doctor, like, hey, you know, I've had a stroke. It takes me a little bit of time to process information or I'm not going to be able to write all of this down because writing is too hard or comprehension is a little challenging for me. So can I record it, this session with you? And then you can go home and take your time to delve through it. Yeah. Uh, I used to, when I was in school, I used to, uh, I called it unconscious learning but I used to take my notes and I would lay them out on audacity, which is just a speech program or whatever. And basically lay, lay them out on a track and then put a beat behind them, you know, cause how we were talking about how music there's a different spot for music. And then I would just listen to that over and over and over again. And then I'd listen to that when I was sleeping on repeat over and over and over again so you know i'd wake up and i'd be like listen to the beat oh you know you're using memory strategies that's a really nice little memory tool that you can bring out so repetition mm -hmm. uh, is really wonderful little memory tool and you kind of paired it with music that's relevant for you and was a, a useful tool for you mm -hmm. i mean that, that's a great memory strategy yeah yeah it, help, it helped a lot and you know, you also talked about um, something about, uh, you know, a memory being affected and whatnot. And, you know, it made me think how, you know, how tough it was for me to get through my MBA program, you know, because of my memory and whatnot and having to, you know, take all these tests, you know, because you got your master's right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so you know how it is having to take all these tests and whatnot and having to, you know, do all this stuff. So, you know, you can always have your nose in the book and studying and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, you know, sometimes I look back on it and I can't even remember, you know, some of the simplest things. Like, for instance, not that long ago, my wife was like, hey, can you take out the trash? We're standing in the kitchen like, hey, can you take out the trash? And we're standing there talking. And then just a few minutes go by and I just walk right by the trash because, you know, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. I think, you you know, compensating for those things, especially early on in the stroke process is really great. So having like task lists and if something comes to your mind, it's like, oh, yeah, I got to do this. Like having somewhere really quick that you can just jot down those little extraneous thoughts that come in just so they're not like fleeting thoughts because we all have fleeting thoughts that come in we just sometimes don't want them to leave so quickly and so we have to do something with that information right away in order to keep it in our mind so jotting it down or like hey alexa remember to do this 
uh, or whatever other tool you have to get that information across text it or uh, you know just put it down somewhere or if you have nothing try to repeat it. repeat it repeat it repeat it three or more times repeat it and then that information will stick long enough hopefully to where you go to want to remember it later and it comes mm -hmm. yeah now Lindsay Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with everyone the amazingness that you shared. Do you have any concluding thoughts for the community? Well, I kind of like loop it back to what I mentioned before is just communication as a human right. And while some people have so many challenges with verbal communication, I hope that today brought you some hope that there's this multi-modality way that you can communicate a message and that you have uh, so many, there's so many great resources out there and ways to challenge your brain on a regular everyday basis. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping that you kind of take some of the activities today and you start to really get a little creative, like use the environment around you, the people around you to create therapeutic activities and don't give up. Awesome. Yeah, and my concluding thoughts for today is, you know, thank you so much, as I already said, Lindsay, for coming on and sharing your wisdom with everyone. And, you know, what Lindsay already stated earlier, um, you know, they they give you a six month time frame, but that's just saying that your brain, that's when the brain is healing and the prime time to get the therapy in now that doesn't mean that you stop the therapy there you keep going keep going keep going because the therapy never ends there's always room for improvement you can always get better so never stop with the therapy keep going keep going keep going yes now um with that being said Lindsay, i always end my shows with a prayer so Let's do it here. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for joining me with Lindsay on the Determined Show so that she can come on and share her wisdom with the community, hopefully reaching many people so that they know that they can continue their speech therapy at home, continuing to grow their vocabulary, their speech, and continuing to get better, making strides in their recovery. And I hope that they can gain more determination within their recovery. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you, thanks for having me on. Thank you, everyone for watching.